Yeah, I think uh, we are good to go. Good to go. Hmm. All right. So I just introduce myself, I guess. Yeah. All yours. All right. Wonderful. Hello, everyone. Yeah. So this is going to be a five week lecture series, as you may have seen the announcements about. And we're going to be going over kind of the, the merge or integration between nanotechnology and quantum technology, how we use nanotechnology tools in the laboratory, the, the hardware to build quantum hardware. And there's, there's, there, there, are some under thing, there are some important things to understand within nanotechnology that will help you get to this point. And of course, you can use nanotechnology for other purposes, but you, generally speaking, we, uh, we have ways of creating these devices that have quantum effects. And we'll get more into that as, as time goes on in the next five weeks. So this, this uh, presentation here that for today's lecture, short, relatively short lecture, we're going to be introducing this idea of nanotechnology which is, in particular, we're, we're using solid state uh, materials or solid state ideas. And then there's, there, there are some other you know, non-solid state technology, which we will sort of briefly mention, but for now, we'll, we'll, we'll do this. And then, so my name is Henri J. Benali, and I'm here at the University of Minnesota. And <laughs> this is, the work I'm doing here is, is in the electrical and computer engineering department. And we have a, a really heavy collaboration with multiple other departments as well. So technically we could like list collaborations, but we're not necessarily pointing out or highlighting specific work that's been done in the collaboration. We're just kind of going over things in general. So that's that's what this is about. This is well, we can get into the technical side if if you wish. But this is, there, there's no particular prerequisite for you know, going over these topics. We, we won't necessarily uh, call, introduce a barrier to entries. In fact, I, I was explaining earlier that this will be a, a zero barrier to entry. <laughs> uh, so my, my boss, my professor, my principal investigator, PI, we call him, is uh, Professor Jim Ping Wong. He's a distinguished McKnight University professor here at the university, which means that he's, he's really he's highly qualified. He did, he's really good at what he does, and he's well, very well experienced in the field of, in this case, quantum spintronics. So that's what we're doing. And uh, I'll, I'll kind of go over some of those, introduce, introduce, introducing some of those ideas. So uh, here are the table of contents. I'm going to go over a little quick bio. And then we're going to talk about what quantum grad is about. I didn't put that here, but that will be uh, after this slide. And then we'll, we'll kind of introduce some background, some motivation for why this work is important. And then we'll get into like the scale wise. How do we, how do we start to understand what nanotechnology means and what, what is considered nanoscale, things like that. And then how, how quantum effects start to play into it. And then we're going to talk about sort of a list of physical qubits. This is just going to be a quick overview of what the physical qubits are as far as the name or as far as the function. Just a quick, very, very quick overview. And then in the next few lectures, actually, we're going to talk about what those physical qubits do and what they actually look like in pictures. So the physical device, the real pictures, not we're, we're going to try to do a comparison between the drawing or the diagram, which is, you know, like a cartoon drawing or an animation, and then show that like with a side side by side view of the actual physical chip. And then we'll talk about chips, chips, chips again, because nanotechnology, this is this chips everywhere. And we'll we'll do that. And then we're gonna talk about some some differences between solid state and non-solid state, just just general in general. And then we're going to talk about this thing called a phase diagram. So like I said, no worries, even though that there are some technical terms here, but I will explain them as, as best as I can from a hardware standpoint. 
So uh, just to be clear, I'm not a, not really a theory guy. So <laughs> uh, you you have no worries. And the other thing I will note is we will not be using equations, or we will try to avoid using equations throughout this lecture series for for that sake. Um, but we have lists of references that we can provide as well. And of course, the quantum stack overview to kind of recapture or take a step back and look about, look at what this hardware is all about. So, and then uh, conclusion. And then we'll, we'll, we'll move on and then we'll give some announcements. So, as I mentioned, I'm going to be using a lot of, a lot of pictures, a lot of diagrams, lots of analogies and metaphors. These are all key, very, very important things to do when you're trying to communicate something that is uh, complex as quantum hardware <laughs> and even nanotechnology in general that is used even for classical purposes. But in this case, for, for this purpose, you can see here in this, in this particular slide, I have a, a picture here that's, it's a generation, it's, it's been generated using Microsoft Bing AI. There's a, they have a tool on their images tab or images uh, page. And then you can just enter a prompt and say, um, what is, or can you please generate something that looks like Blender, like a Blender 3D, like a 3D model of something that's been rendered to represent growth or like a transition from beginner level to advanced level. And so this is the image that I produce. See, this is a pretty useful illustration, visualization. And in this case, um, I mean, that's, that's what, this is one side of quantum grad, like what we're doing right now is uh, the tutorial or the public lecture series. And this is open you know, to the public given the word, the keyword there is public. <laughs> and basically uh, quantum grad is, is a number of other things. It's a, basically an effort to provide a number of resources and other relevant content, useful content that will help you grow and it will, it will give you a, a sort of a reach or the ability to, to know what to look for as far as your general interest in quantum technology or emerging technology. And then like, if you want to use it as a career, then we also have job resources, things like that, that are available on quantum grad website. And then we have, of course, you know, hackathons, conferences, books, other, m number of other things like this to keep to keep one updated. So that's that's what's going on. And uh, that's what we do at Quantum Grab. So I'm essentially a member of Quantum Grab. So here we are. <laughs> and there's a little background of who I am. So I'm originally from a place called Oak Springs. We say Tsech Iliatok in Navajo. So Navajo, the Navajo Nation or the Navajo language we call it Denebikeya. The Navajo language is Denebizad, or uh, we, we have some other names, Nabeho. There's some linguistics <laughs> behind this, but this is basically where I'm from. This is the seal that we use to represent our tribe. And this is, of course, the largest Native American tribe in the United States, in the Southwest region, primarily in Arizona. So I'm from Arizona, Australia, man. And, um, as I mentioned, I'm here in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, and I've been here since about 2017. And I came here as an undergraduate. So I actually got involved in quantum technology as an undergraduate, as a young man, very young, so like 19, 20 years old or so. And then, of course, I did some previous research before that, and this was all before the bachelor's degree program. So. This is just kind of an example. You can, you can get involved in, in things like this as long as you express an interest and uh, talk with people, kind of network. Go to events like this, like the event we're having right now. So if you come and we ask questions, we can help each other put, put each other in touch with you know, prominent researchers in the field or you know, people, who, people who know other people in the industry, both industry and academics. So just, just, uh, just to point that out. And then here, I recently became a quantum hardware team leader at the Nanomagnetism and Quantum Spectronics Lab, which is here at the University of Minnesota. 
and basically I'm doing a PhD program. And all of this was basically a, like a recruitment. They recruited me into the PhD program because of my interest in nanotechnology. And I've had some experience with nanotechnology. And so for that reason, my area of work primarily is focused on the development of the quantum hardware and then the nanofabrication side. So I do a lot of nanofabrication in the clean room, the laboratory, and then I train people and then new people were, were looking to bring new people in, in the future to try to train people in, in quantum hardware development using nanotechnology. So uh, on top of that, I'm also a quant uh, quantum developer uh, certified by IBM. They gave us some training for that. And then also a uh, quantum provider administrator from IBM. Uh, this is kind of like a voluntary position. You know, you're not necessarily like getting paid to do this work, but it's, it's very important. And if you want to get paid in the future, that's up to you. For now, I'm doing PhD work, so I, I, I can only do so much. And of course, a member of quantum grad and I, I triple quantum. So like I said, here's the map. This is where I'm from, a place called Arizona. And then the the place in the mountains is that you can see a mountain region here. This is this is about three thousand meters above sea level, or about ten thousand feet, just under ten thousand feet. And to give you a reference, if you go to the Himalayas in, in northern India, or maybe in Nepal, they have a place called Kathmandu, and where I live is actually higher than has a higher elevation than Kathmandu, which is kind of fun. But yeah, that's where I'm from. And then I spent my whole life there in the countryside. It's just, it's just wilderness, trees, and rocks. But I'm here in Minneapolis, in Minnesota. This place has a lot of trees, but the elevation is very low here. Uh, very different place compared to where I'm from. And it's also very populated here in Minneapolis. That's the other thing. Lots of people. <laughs> Anyways, we, we, uh, that's where we're doing our quantum technology research. And here's kind of like a collage of some of the work that I've been doing as far as nanotechnology, using nanotechnology to build quantum devices. So this is a GIF. I, I like using GIFs, animations, illustrations. And you can see there's kind of like a sweep of all these images uh, of diagrams and pictures of chips that I've made in the laboratory and other things. So it's, these are all, these will all be available after the, Presentation too long, but that's just to kind of give you an overview. It's like a sneak peek of what we're going to be going on. And then here is a quick summary of the familiar devices that will introduce what nanotechnology is. So let's begin. So we have fire. Wonderful. So you can also take this hint if you want in the future. You want to make really nice slides. You can you can go to Wikimedia Commons or you can go to some other GIF making website, or you can even make your own GIFs. You can introduce the, the video like this and it will play by itself. You don't have to click on it necessarily to make it play for this loop automatically. So um, here's a picture of fire, of course. So we use fire to either generate heat to keep us warm, or we use fire to as a light source to, to light up a room. And if we want to, Turn the room dark again. If we were in, if it was a fire, maybe like a cave, or you're outside somewhere in the wilderness, and you build a fire, then it, it will generate light. But if you want to turn off the light, then you just simply put the fire out, right? Throw some sand on it or, or water or something. Then that will it will make it dark. So in that case, it's a very basic and simple means of controlling controlling a light source. You are it's kind of like an extended way of switching on and off a light, a light source. So this is what this is for. And of course we can use, we don't have to necessarily build a big fire. We can even make a small fire, take a candle. And then the candle, it's got one little flame. You can light the candle and based on how bright it is, you can light up a certain, certain size of a room, a small one maybe. Or if you don't want the light, you just burn out the candle, easy. So you, you have made a very basic switch. And that's where this, begin, this where it begins. <laughs> as they say, our advancement as humanity is, has been 
I've been a big part of, or should I say, starting fires or fighting with fire has been a big, big part of, of human advancements going from very basic living all the way up to making advanced technology like what we have today. So this is where it begins. And then we, we start to move on to like, like maybe irrigation. And like if you make a farm, if you, if you grew up on a farm or if you, if you go to a place that has uh, any means of controlling water, then you can also make another switching mechanism. And this is just a valve. It's a valve. You can close it. You can shut it. Close, you can basically create a gate. You can open it and close it however you wish. It's a mechanical, typically mechanical device. And then water will flow inside of here when it's open and it'll flow out the other side. You get the basic idea. It's a plug, it's a, it's a gate. You can turn it off and on as you wish. So that's, that's another way of creating a switch on and off. And then when we move on to electrical means as time goes on, we, we learn to create like electrical circuits. And we, we try to, we, we learn that we can store electrical charge inside of some kind of capacitive element or maybe a, a charge, charge storage, like a battery. And then we can, we can also create switches out of that as well. We can introduce uh, a simple mechanism that will simply contact or decontact that circuit. You can open and close the circuit as you wish. And so you have a basic switch, electrical switch in this case. So that's that's a little bit more down the line, uh, a little little ways down in history, quite quite a ways actually from just building fire. <laughs> so big step there. And then we get on to some other technology, maybe like the nineteen uh, mid nineteen hundred, early nineteen hundred. We have these things, the uh, vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes are still relevant today because of their ability to to draw a lot of power and reproduce or generate very high frequency with much greater efficiency uh, using only one device. Here in this case, this vacuum tube. So this vacuum tube here, this is another switching mechanism. Of course, the vacuum tube is not only limited to acting as a switch, but you can also use it to amplify a signal that you that is coming into the device, electrical signal. And then you can also use it to uh, convert direct current into AC or vice versa. You can convert AC into direct current through this device. You can also use it for many other purposes and audio or either just maybe just radio transmission, things like that. So that's why they're still relevant. They're using a lot of radio equipment, high power radio equipment. So that's, that's a vacuum chip. It looks kind of like a light bulb. <laughs> And then as, as time goes on, we, we start to uh, see that we can use the physical structure, the crystal structure of a maybe a bunch of atoms, in this case, that are introduced with impurity. And then if we introduce a gating mechanism here, in this case, it's, it's a piece of metal that's attached to this semiconductor, then it will start to produce this passageway for electrical current to flow from one side of, of a device to another. So again, it is, you can use it as a basic switch as you wish. And if you kind of reconfigure it in, in another way, you can use it as an amplifier as well, and some other, some other novel services. So again, we have another switch. So there are some parallelisms between all of these kinds of technologies, is that we have the ability to turn or to turn something off or turn on or manipulate the signals that are being generated or flowing through that device. So as time goes on, again, we, we're able to create laser technology. And of course, you will see this is relevant in quantum technology because without, without using all of these understandings of wave mechanics, which is essentially a big part of quantum mechanics, we, we can actually create all of these layers inside of a device that can introduce light or generate light. And that light is just all of this resonating frequencies 
these signals between these very thin layers of material. And so they, people call this a quantum well, simply because, well, it's a very thin layer. If it's, if it's a thick layer of material, then we won't, we won't necessarily call it a quantum, we call something else. But the other thing to note is you need this quantum well for this particular laser device to work. So this is essentially a solid state laser or uh, a semiconductor or maybe a, some other semi-metal base or three, what, what they call like a three, five device, three, five based laser device or some other, some other compound. Just pick, just pick what you want and then make sure the properties, it has the properties that you need. So we'll go over some of those things as time goes on. So this is just to give you an idea. This is, this is how we ended up. We ended up creating chips. We ended up having devices that can expose energy beams and we can re, really fine tune these energy waves that are coming from the devices or from these uh, components. And then we can try to make them smaller and smaller inside of these machines to create all of these patterns. So we'll go over, for now, this is just an overview to give you an idea, but we will go over the lithography process, which is, you know, people think of basic, you just understand, oh, look, I see a picture of a lithography machine or a deposition machine. Uh, I, I can understand it. But Typically, that's not that's not how it goes. You have to kind of think about it and see some many different animations or diagrams. It'll it'll give you a, a much better idea of what's happening inside of the machine to help us build these nano devices. So, on the left here, you can see there's a, a wafer that's been produced, fabricated at IBM Research, and then this is a picture, actually a cross section picture. This is a side view. Of a of a device, it's a it's a transistor component, and it has all these nodes in there. So this is a, a nano sheet device that we call a two nanometer node, and so that's what this is showing. And this is a picture that has been taken using a a device like a transmission electron microscope. So there are, there are many kinds of transmission or many kinds of machines that do imaging and spectroscopy. But in this particular example, we have these electron microscopes. And you can also make a tree, you can make a big diagram showing how many different kinds of electron microscopes exist. So that's basically, we just pick one of them, one of those machines and you can take this picture here in the middle. And then you can inspect, you can observe what's happening. And then you can take measurements here. I didn't put a scale bar on this, um, on this particular, diagram, but the idea is that it has two nanometer feature. And then here on the right side, maybe may, maybe many of our audience members never heard of, but this is called a single atom transistor. And this is another spec, uh, imaging method that we use in the laboratory. And this is what we call uh, atomic force microscopy. Basically, uh, it's like a needle tapping. I, I will show again in the future what an AFM device is, but or microscope, AFM microscope is, atomic force microscope is to take this kind of image. But this here in the middle, that, that is a single atom. So this is a, an atom that has been doped or introduced into this layer of material. So this could be some kind of semiconductor or some other substrate material, a supporting material. So substrate just means that you have a layer of material that, that's like a foundation, kind of like how you have a house. When you build a house, you need a foundation. Foundation is like a supporting structure at the base. So in this case, for devices, we have substrate. And it is, and uh, here, this blue area is the substrate. And then this pink, these pink uh, little representations of our representations of molecules that are on this device. And then here's one little atom or one little molecule. Well, in this case, uh, an atom, it's just one atom because it's a single atom transistor. So this is a, a basic switch. Here's a group of switches, and here's an even bigger group of switches. They're not necessarily the, uh, the same, made of the same material or anything, but they all have the same basic content and more, depending on how it's been designed. But they should all have the ability to switch something on and off. In this case, switching uh, very small amounts of electrical. So 
when we talk about the scale of quantum devices or nano devices in general, we we typically look at something that's that uh, that has the scale of about let's say ten atoms. So if we if we look at uh, this is actually this is the motivation for uh, why we need nanostructures to build a quantum device. So basically, here we have uh, all these little dots in this picture here, and what these dots represent are they're, they're representations of, of atoms. So if you take a an electron microscope, a transmission electron microscope, or maybe a scanning tunneling electron microscope, or some other kind of electron microscope that allows you to get to this resolution, you can actually see all of these atoms lined up next to each other. And uh, later on, I will show you how we can use like analogies in the real world, like Lego bricks to represent all of these atoms. So you can think of all these little atoms as individual bricks. So you could take a brick, and you can stack them up next to each other, and then you get more or less a pattern that looks like this. And sometimes those patterns are are neatly arranged, or they are some of them they get they they get uh, arranged in different orders, or they, they get randomly arranged, and we have names for those. They're called amorphous structures. And if they're neatly arranged, we call them crystalline structures. They they're nicely lined up. Like this you can see a lattice. So that's why we call it a lattice. The lattice is just another word for a, a nicely ordered system. It's a nice, nice pattern. So these are patterns that we're looking at, or representations of patterns, based off of how those in electrons in the individual atoms are interacting with the machine. So um, what I'm showing here is that we can take this device, something like this. In this case, this is an example of a tunneling junction. This is a, a tunnel junction. This middle layer right here is, is a, supposed to be insulated. That means there's a barrier in the center. And if you're trying to send electrical current from left to right, that barrier is not going to allow the electrical current to, to jump from one side to the other. And you can also try to limit the, uh, in this case, like, like a magnetic, this energy or this angular momentum from, from these nanomagnets from jumping from one side to the other. So this barrier, is, is a key component in many quantum devices. You can also look at Josephson junction. They also have a barrier mechanism inside of it. And all these barriers, they're just ways of stopping something from getting to the other side. And I mean, if you want to control something, turn, a, turn something on or off, you need some kind of barrier, either a physical barrier or a physical barrier that will interface or that, that will allow you to control something, this, this switching. So in, in this case, this oxide is, is the bed, magnesium. And then this is a picture I took on the left side. This is a picture electron microscope uh, that I used in the laboratory. And then this is a, a device that is about 100 nanometers. And this, this device is, is very small, but it has all of these tunnel junctions, these tunnel barriers in it. And essentially, you can use this device here on the left side to switch something. I just call the switch from on to off, or you can either try to store information in it if you like. Because it, it's uh, basically, it doesn't necessarily need electrical current to turn off and off, on, but you can if you want. You can interface it with uh, something like a transistor, make it a bit more complex for those kinds of things. And then you can use it, uh, make it bigger, and you can try to, when I say bigger, I mean like build a bunch of them all together on one big chip and then turn it into like a, like a memory architecture for computers, computer chips. So that's, that's, this is the representation. And then on the right side, there's a, this is a graphic a GIF that's been generated with Python code to basically represent all of these energy levels of of these uh, electrons. So you can see the, the probability densities or the, the density of states here, or basically where, where, do you, where is the uh, electron most likely to exist with a particular 
energy level. So you can use this graphic representation to show that there is a probability density in this in this structure here. And then we can try to map this, map something like this to uh, either a single atom or to a bunch of atoms. You, you can experiment with those methods in the laboratory. So these, these all come from, again, nanostructures. And then uh, where does all this uh, motivation come from? So there are theorists, there are people who try to think about what's going on in the laboratory and what, what kind of use can we get out of it? So in this case, uh, Richard Weiman, a rather famous physicist, uh, he's like, he came up with this idea or thought of this uh, idea of creating a quantum simulator. And then there are some other people who are supporting that idea as well. And what, are, what they're doing is like thinking about how we use quantum mechanics to do maybe computation methods. So in this case, we need, if we're gonna do quantum computation or simulate quantum effects, it's, it would be much easier to do, much more convenient and more accurate if we were to actually use some kind of device or some kind of component that has real quantum mechanical effects rather than just a simple switching mechanism. Of course, you can use a switching mechanism to interface with it, but that's, that's a, about as much as you can do as far as accuracy. So in the device um, for, for qubits, specifically aimed at qubits, we, we can think of them as uh, an anharmonic oscillator. So the anharmonic oscillator is simply just a way of, of saying that we can measure the device and we can try to like resonate the device. And if it gives us an energy signature or energy readout, then those energy readouts should not be evenly spaced apart. So for this, for this purpose, you can see uh, here in red, this is a representation of what that energy signature is supposed to look like. So the energy signature, is this is just one way to represent it on a diagram. If you were to look at a different diagram, you can split up those frequencies and measure a specific frequency, and then it'll show you like a little wave pattern um, on, on a graph of quantum. There's, there are different, multiple ways of trying to represent these, these energy levels and energy signatures. And it's, it's all really just at that point, kind of like data science or data representation or data visualization. You can pick uh, various standard methods as you wish, but this is, this is just one representation of trying to understand how, how to look at the energy signatures that are coming from a, a physical qubit. So this is a, a 3D model of three different kinds of qubits, or should I say three generations of qubits. They're not, they weren't necessarily all developed at the same time or simultaneously, but as, as people you know, build ideas as, as you would in any setting, you, what you do is you, you have one idea or maybe a couple of ideas, and then you implement them maybe one by one. And then, you, you might have better ideas as time goes on, you learn something, and then you end up making more devices that have better performance or it, it's more efficient or it, it uses less materials or, or something like that. It costs less to make or maybe it's, it's got some novel purpose, some new purpose that, that you can use to, to create some kind of system, in this case for computation um, without these, these qubits. So this is just this, what's being represented. And then as far as the devices is concerned, are concerned, then we can also look at other plots like this, a 2D plot, which represents, in this case, a quote unquote, Moore's law for quantum devices, the qubits. There are various kinds of qubits that are based off of different kinds of mechanisms, either photonics, magnetics, electronics, and so forth. So, so many different kinds. So that's, that's what this is represented here. And typically the trajectory is, is uh, much more dramatic compared to the traditional or conventional Moore's law that's applied to classical trend systems. So uh, as far as the physical qubits goes, um, we'll, we will see, I mean, this is just a list or a diagram of showing what the qubits look like. And we will also show some 
some further motivation in the next presentation, not today, maybe next week. We'll talk about what the physical qubits can do as far as scaling, like quantum volume, what do these terms mean, things like that. But we'll, we'll get to that point. For now, we're just kind of looking at uh, a general sneak peek of, of what these physical qubits are called and what, what they represent. So in this case, we, we have, I, I put it in different colors here. Anything in blue, you'll see here, that is what is called a non-solid state qubit. So it's based off of photons. There are some solid state components in them that you can probably use to control the device per se, but it's not, it's not necessarily the mechanism that's being exploited to, to make the qubit work. So those are non-solid state components. But for solid state components, solid state qubits, which come from the solid state nano devices, then we can look at whatever is highlighted here in green. And I hope everybody can see the screen color. I might need to change it because uh, I, I realized that some, some people might not be able to see the green color or something. So hopefully you can see at least a difference in color between these two. Uh, anyway, so these, these are all kind of ways of, of representing the different kind of information that's coming from those kind of qubits. And then this is, these are the physical representations of those qubits as well. So if you want to uh, look at the ground state, then the ground state in this case from like a photon, photonic system uh, should, be, should be like a horizontal, like a horizontal representation on a graph or maybe a vertical representation or even maybe the, I would say the polarization you can change the polarization from horizontal to vertical, which can be plotted on a graph as well. And that's, both, that's, that's the photonic system. But for, in this case, um, a very common one, the Joseph's induction, you can take something like a chart or maybe a phase, then you can see there's a graph here showing uh, whether or not something has been, something is being represented in a ground state or an excited state. They're, they're, you basically just need an on and off switch, and then maybe it's it's a bit more complicated than that because you're not you're not necessarily creating a switch in this case. You are you are trying to represent or map out these these energy states in the device uh, to various levels, quantized levels, these intervals that I was showing earlier. So this this is just in this case for the qubits. You can also make q trips. Um, there there are some other kind of devices that you can introduce maybe four or five different levels. Those are experimental devices, but for this case, we're only using two of them, zero and one. So anyway, we're, we're getting close, pretty close to the end. I would say a couple of more slides to go, but here we have, like I mentioned, a phase diagram. This is just a way to, to create a map. When you are building a quantum device or a nano device in this case, we can say, for example, this is, uh, we pick an element. So the element in this case is an element of tantalum. It's a metal. And then on the right side, there's another element, nitrogen, which is a gas, right? And at least a room. <laughs> and we can, we can pick these two materials and then we can kind of try to mix them together inside of a vacuum chamber. So vacuum chamber, I will show more pictures later. This is just a, a general concept to show you what's happening. So you have a, a supporting uh, substrate here. Actually, yeah, here's the substrate, and here's the target of metal. So this, so in this case, if you have tantalum here, a piece of metal, a shiny silvery metal, you can you can place it here, that chunk of metal, and in place of this target area. And then what will happen is you can introduce a beam of energy. That will focus onto this onto this piece of metal here, and then <clears throat> you can uh, hook up a vacuum tube or some other high voltage, a controlled high voltage source here on this negative and positive uh, part of this chamber. And then what will, what that will do is it will allow you to control the direction of of that energy beam that's being that's being introduced here. And then you can also use it to well, actually, in this case, you, you are taking an energy beam, and then 
But then what happens is the atoms will start flying off. Kind of like, um, think of it as like spray painting. So you're, you're spray painting an atom <laughs> from this chunk of metal. And then that, that uh, atom will start to pile up on top of this supporting substrate. And this is where, this is where you get chips from. This substrate is just a piece of, could be a piece of silicon wafer or some, some other material like magnesium oxide, or it could be maybe a special kind of crystal, a sapphire, as you wish. Whatever you, whatever you want, you can place that compatible substrate here. It's experiment with it. I mean, it's up to you. You got money. <laughs> you, can, you can put whatever kind of substrate as you wish, put it right here. So that so you can find out whether or not something is is uh, got useful effects. But in this case, we are taking atoms and we're just kind of controlling them inside of the chamber and trying to deposit it here on this sheet. So that's what this is. And then on the on the right side, like I said, uh, just just to be clear, you pick you pick a spot. So let's say you had a dart. I should have brought a dart. But let's say you had a dart and you wanted to pick somewhere on this face diagram yeah. what kind of what kind of temperatures it needs to have, or maybe you want a specific a specific kind of mm, property. Should it be hard? Should it be crystalline? Should it be nice and organized? Should the material be more con more electrically conductive? Should it be less electrically conductive, or should it be or should I say, should it be insulating, <laughs> which was which is the same as electrically less or non-conductive material? We we can pick whatever we whatever we like here on this phase diagram, and then we can say, for example, I want a delta tantalum nitride right here. So this symbol right here is a Greek symbol, it means delta, but this is just to represent that there, this one particular kind of tantalum that has been made into a compound with nitrogen. We can we can select right here on, on any spot, and then what we need to do to get to that point is uh, introduce a mixture of like forty percent nitrogen inside of this chamber, and then no forty five that's yes, well more like forty five forty five percent nitrogen mixture inside of this chamber, and then what temperature should we heat this heat this chamber up to? So we should be like in this case, it shows 1966 degrees Kelvin. You can convert that into Celsius. There are conversion diagrams for that, but or conversion tables for that. You can take whatever you like here in this temperature range up to like it says here, 3,404 degrees Kelvin. And then you can pick somewhere in between here. And whatever that temperature is, you can you can fine tune that temperature within this vacuum chamber and then introduce a mixture of like 45% nitrogen. So now, actually now I realize I should have put a small table here. If you wanted to get something like delta tantalum nitride, then what you need is a mixture of 45% nitrogen inside of the chamber and then uh, com combined with the temperature of something like maybe 2,500 degrees Kelvin. I'm not sure what that is in Celsius off the top of my head, but you can convert that if you like. And then once you once you achieve those parameters and then let it grow for a while, then you can actually uh, take it out of the chamber. You know, turn everything back off and then open the chamber and then look at whether or not there's a thin layer of metal on the substrate. So that's how that's how we create chips. We we want something that has a particular property, and then we just kind of pick whatever part of this diagram we, we need to pick. And then we, we kind of use this, this guiding map to tell us where to go. That's all it is, which is why I said we can use it as a guiding map. So hopefully that makes sense. You can ask for if you want. And then here's some other motivation. This is basically showing like you can further take, after, after you grow a piece of metal, you can slice it apart, you can dice it. And in order to do that, we take we take this uh, piece of metal on a, on a chip, and then we place it inside of a chamber that looks like this, or maybe like this. Here's a more realistic picture. Then inside of this machine, it has a has a bunch of 
control components, an ion grid and some other things that will create an ion beam. So there are some components, electrical components inside of here, which will allow you to introduce a high energy beam that is ionized from an atom of, of a gas like argon. Typically we use argon uh, atoms or argon gas atoms inside of here. And then we, we energize them. And then we basically introduce uh, some momentum into that beam. And what that beam does is, is it's gonna start slicing away at this piece of metal that was that we just grow inside of the chain. So you can slice the specific part of the of the chip if you want with a, with a pattern, or you can expose the general area of the chip, the entire chip that has a pattern that's been you know drawn on with a stencil structure like a lithography, direct right lithography. So this is right here, this is that night uh, a picture of what the, the lithography machine looks like. So I use this machine here on the right. This is called a Wraith electron beam uh, lithography system. It's a direct right system. It's kind of like taking a laser beam inside of this chamber, and then you can control the laser beam. Except in this case, it's not an act we're not using photons because you know photons come that they're using laser. But in this case, we are taking an electron gun. And that electron gun will energize this electron beam, and then we can fine tune the beam of electron down to uh, about a, the size of an atom or even less, um, give or take, depending on what kind of machine set you have. But basically, we we can focus that electron beam uh, onto a, a piece of substrate, maybe a dice substrate. Or you can even take an entire substrate, a big chip, a big wafer, and place it in this machine. And then it'll, it'll start to focus or draw features onto that chip. I will show again, I, I'm just, I, I, will, I must keep reminding our audience that I will show more pictures of what that process looks like. We have uh, diagrams and animations for those to help you visualize how this machine works. So no, no worries. Uh, this, this is just a picture of it for now. And this machine on the left side, this uses extreme ultraviolet lithography. So it's, what that means is it uses photons, really high energy photons, not quite high as, as an electron beam, but it's still high enough that you can create nanoscale features. And like the like that two nanometer node of that transistor chip or that chip that was made by IBM, they use a system similar to this from ASML, it's a very famous company that's known for making lithography machines. So what they do, of course, again, we, you can expose and write features on chips. But again, this machine on the left side is way more expensive compared to the one on the right. That's the other thing. And it's obviously a really huge machine. <laughs> you can actually walk inside of this machine and service it. But this electron beam on the right side, it's that's basically it right there. You can't really walk inside it. It's all enclosed. <laughs> Anyways, so where does all the, where do all these chips go when we finish building them? We we talk about like hardware footprint. Uh, hardware footprint is just another way of saying we have some chips and they all have different sizes. But where do they go? They go here on this bottom level here, the device level. All those chips sit in this area at the very bottom of this stack, this quantum stack, if we call it. And this architecture consists of uh, this, this component here from algorithms down to the device level. And the control software, of course, the electronics, uh, yeah, software exists on these like two top layers here. And then the control electronics, this is where you start to introduce all of these uh, analog components like you see here on the right. We'll show more pictures later. But what that does is allow you to further control all the signals that are needed to, to introduce energy into a device, like a qubit or some other nanostructure. And then you can use that uh, to, to read out as well. It's kind of a two-way system. You, <clears throat> you introduce this circuit here that will send energy into a chip. And then what the chip will do will, is it's going to respond and send a signal back into the circuit. So it's a two-way circuit. It's like a transceiver almost. And 
what that does is it's going to uh, listen for that circuit and then try to plot that onto a graph. You can extract the data if you want and do, do as many tests, you know, benchmarking, hardware benchmarking, randomized benchmarking. Uh, there, there are different names for it, but generally speaking, this, this entire system contains a chip. There's a chip in almost, I would say, just about every quantum computing device has a chip that is the, the that has the quantum components. Whether if it's photonics or if it's a magnetic device or if it's a superconducting device, they're all on some form of chip that exists here. It's just that all the control components and all the interconnects out here, the or should I say interface, they all exist out here. And these these components on the outside, besides the chip itself, they all they all can range from the size of a desktop machine, or they can uh, reach the size of a room. They can fill up, you can fill up the size of a room, like one room. Say, like in this room I'm in right now, the, it's, not, it's not a very big room, it's just a medium room, but you could fit a certain kind of quantum computer in here. The chip will still be roughly about this size. I can, I can hold it in my hand, the chip. But in order to control that chip, you need this big machine. And some of them, some are some of them are really big, like the size of this room, or some of them are like you can have it inside of a desktop machine, like, like any PC, like a Windows machine or something. Roughly that size. But the only thing is how how well can you control the device and how consistent will it be in performance? Those are other considerations. But if you just want to use it as a learning tool or use it for um, extracting very basic quantum information that, that, that can be used to demonstrate something, then you can use it inside of a small machine. It's possible. I will show pictures of those again later as time goes on. So uh, again, here's just an example. This is, these are some chips that I made. These are tunneling devices. We call them nano MTJs. I didn't type the name out here, but these are called magnetic tunnel junctions. They're nano devices that are roughly about the the smallest feature on this device is about 100 nanometers. Uh, we have a, another one; it's about 80 nanometers. So this this I took pictures of multiple chips. So this this could be either 80 nanometers or 100 nanometers, one of those two. And that little device here, or that little component, is just a pillar of metal. And that, that, that piece of metal has a tunnel barrier, which will allow you to create switching a, a storage mechanism that you can you know, switch on and off as you wish for information. But that's just, the, that's just for, the, for utilizing quantum effects on a, a classical feature. Like I said before, you can use nano devices for either classical purposes or quantum, doing quantum logic. So in this case, we're not doing quantum logic for this device. This is just a classical device that uses quantum uh, mechanics to control its very small component. That's all this is. And then um, some other unique features about it is, of course, since it has um, tiny nanomagnets in it, you can use it in, in a very unique way that uh, protects itself. So like if you were to blast an EMP next to this device or maybe like uh, <laughs> expose it to some, some kind of ionizing radiation, then it will protect itself because this is considered a non-volatile device. Okay, so what did we learn for today is that we have qubits that can be made of nano devices and we can use nano devices for, for many different purposes, for either introducing control components or using the devices themselves as, as qubits. And then what we need to understand is that the, the qubit has to produce an energy signature that is anharmonic. And so we call it, in this case, a quantum anharmonic oscillator, meaning that the energy levels should not be equally spaced or equidistant from the other. And then the other point that we that we made here is that we can use phase diagrams as a map. It's a it's a it's a way to give you direction for drawing materials 
these thin film materials that are used in nano devices. And then that will build up some some small intuition for the next lecture, which will which we will get more into the thin film technology. So this 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 presentation today is just kind of give you a, a quick introduction, get you familiar, or you, you'll get you'll recognize some of the terms as we go on. We will <laughs> build this knowledge up together, and then we'll see we'll see how, how what kind of questions people have. Anyways, so as I mentioned, there are a number of different kind of fabrication methods we can use. Electron beam, we can use extreme ultraviolet lithography. Then there are some other like advanced methods like uh, probes, what we call scanning thermal probe lithography, which is personally my favorite. I never got to play with one, but I, I hope to someday. <laughs> and there, there are many other kinds of lithography patterning machines that we can use to create nano devices. And I can show them in some future lectures if you want, where I can provide those materials that they are available with pictures. And then the other thing that we pointed out or highlighted is that we can create these uh, even uh, micro scale devices to create the physical cubits. And of course, the top three that we we see that we that we see in the industry and even in academics is the superconducting kind of qubits, trapped ion qubits, and photon qubits, all of which contain some form of chip. So that's the other thing I want to point out is that quantum computers, the, the qubits themselves typically are contained in some kind of chip. And I would say maybe the next two or three lectures will show sort of a montage <laughs> or, or a collage of all the chips that, that that are used in each of these quantum systems. <laughs> they're all they're all chips. They're all just different formats, but they're chips. Chip, chip, chip. You can make a poem about chips. So that is the end of the presentation today, this today's lecture. And I hope this was useful and helpful. And it wasn't too much in depth, but we'll we'll get more deeper as time goes on. So Thank you. Any questions? Um, thank you for uh, delivering this presentation. I think um, this was um, pretty insightful and everything. And if people have questions, we can take questions and um, we can probably stop recording and we can take the questions offline. <laughs>